Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session about uh, Kodai Yeshkash. What is named uh, Kodai Yeshkash, simpler, faster, and distributed for an hour. My name is Anthony Dahani, and I will uh, walk you through this presentation. So first, let me introduce myself. Uh, Anthony Dahani, um, software engineer f uh, working at uh, Coda, a software AG company. We were actually bought something like uh, five years ago. And before that, uh, Coda also acquired uh, EH Cash. But we'll uh, see uh, uh, this uh, during the presentation as well. I am currently working on the Terracotta Management Console and its integration in Terracotta products. So I get a good overview of what our products at Terracotta are doing, or how they are performing, and what are the interesting uh, metrics uh, together from our products. I'm also uh, a strong Docker supporter. And actually, uh, I'm also using Docker for this presentation at the end uh, for the last demos. But. Oh yeah, sorry, um, I was uh, about to forget. Come visit us at booth number one, and there's an Oculus uh, Rift to win, and also some other goodies. So, um, and of course, if you have any questions about this presentation, we are there to help. So, what about the agenda for this session? Uh, well, first, uh, caching 101. So in this first section, I will talk about uh, basic caching concepts. Um, what is important to understand and where you can find uh, caching in the world of computing. Then we'll move on to the specific cases of caching on the JVM. First, we'll go through a, a little bit of history. And then uh, we'll see what is the specification and what is uh, the recommended uh, implementation. Of course, yes, cache. Um, and then we'll move to clustered caching with Terracotta Server. So I will introduce the concept of, um, cluster, of a cluster cache uh, with Terracotta Server. I will end this uh, presentation with deployment examples. And by deployment examples, I mean real life deployment de uh, examples. So those kind of de deployment that we have at uh, customer sites. OK, so without further ado, Caching 101. So uh, what's a cache? So let's begin with uh, the cache definition. According to wiktionary.com, a cache is a store of things that will be required in the future and can be retrieved rapidly. Now, if you ask uh, a Terracotta engineer what is a cache, usually um, he, will, he or she will answer that a cache it's like a map, or even maybe a temporary map. By map, I mean uh, uh, in, the Java, uh, in the Java sense of the, of the word, key value mappings, with capacity control via eviction and freshness control via expiry. Those are the two most uh, important features uh, of a cache. So, um, where is caching use? Why should you, um, why should you worry about uh, caching information? Well, first of all, at the most uh, basic, uh, I mean, at the, mo at, uh, at the most core uh, location in, uh, in the computing world, uh, CPU. So CPU, they are uh, using themselves uh, caches. So when the CPU is trying to get some data from the register, and it's a miss, so if it couldn't find the data, then it's going to try to load it from the L1 cache, because the L1 cache contains what the register has, plus many other things. And then if the L1 cache uh, doesn't contain this data, then it will fall back to the L2 cache, and then to the RAM. And as you can see, those caches um, are bigger and bigger, but the thing is that they're also slower and slower, so usually, uh, if you want some good performance, you want your data to be very close to the CPU. So, because uh, even after the memory, after the RAM, there's the disk, and maybe the network, and so on. So, caching is used um, in the most basic architecture of uh, hardware. Before um, going further, I would also like um, to remind you with uh, latencies that you could remember. 
So an L1 cache reference is half a nanosecond. So this is the latency to, to hit it. And then for L2 cache reference, seven nanoseconds, it's already 14 times uh, slower than an L1 cache. Then it goes on and on and on. For example, the main memory reference, even um, 20, 20 times slower than the L2 cache. Then reading one megabyte from memory, it's uh, 1,000 um, 1, times slower. And then you can see that with the disks and, of course, the networks, it gets even worse. So, of course, you want your data to be close um, to your application, to your CPU. Caching is also used in other uh, locations. Um, so let's take the example, well, the classic example of someone who is uh, loading a web application from his browser. So the browser will send a request to probably a content delivery network, so a CDN. So hopefully the CDN, uh, one of the CDN endpoints is close to, to his home, so it's going to be faster. Then the CDN is gonna hit uh, a web application server. This web application server is most probably uh, hosting your uh, web application. So this is how I, well, at least an application, and I represented it with a, a little block. This block, this application, will certainly uh, need some information from a system of records, such as a database, or even from a web service. So as you can see, in all this chain, well, there are many network calls, and uh, there is a dramatic need for caching. And actually, this is already the case. So maybe you're already familiar with HTTP caching. Uh, so you know when you, send, uh, when you send a request and get the response in the headers, uh, your browser is instructed to cache the response, for example, for static uh, files such as CSS, JavaScript, HTML, and others. The CDN also is, is acting as a cache because it contains a copy of, of the page from, from your application, and it also contains copies of your static resources. Of course, the CPU is caching, uh, is caching the data, as we uh, just saw earlier on. And there's also the notion of disk caching uh, on, on a database or on some other uh, rem uh, system of records. Finally, uh, there is uh, caching at the application level, and this is what I'm going to focus on uh, during this presentation. Um, Let's move on with uh, some caching theory. Uh, let's talk about the um, Amdahl's uh, law. So it's a little bit of uh, mathematics. Uh, as you can see, this equation is describing uh, the theoretical speed up uh, that is always limited by the part of the task that cannot benefit from the improvement. So what, what this basically means, uh, if you look at the example at the bottom of the slide, is that, for example, if you have an operation that needs two tasks to be executed, for example, task A in blue and task B in red. If you're getting the result just after the execution of those two, ta of those two tasks, you will, of course, try to make them uh, more performant. The thing that you need to remember is, for example, if you're trying to make B, that, is, that has the uh, smaller latency, if you're trying to make B faster, you won't have a huge gain overall. Whereas if you try to make faster Operation A, that is, that is taking much longer. And in that case, um, uh, you will get uh, a much better, a much better result, um, a much, uh, um, a much more reduced latency. So. Also, um, the long tail. So, for example, um, if we talk about a website that is uh, allowing you to do searches on, on, on ice cream flavors. Do you, think that, um, do you think that the number of searches is going to look like this? I mean, do you think that each flavor is going to be requested the same amount of time? Well, no. Actually, in real life, some flavors are more popular than others. And usually, you would rather get a distribution of searches that would rather look like this. And if you look closely, you will notice that the 20% uh, of your data set 
is requested 80% of the time. This is what we call also the Pareto law or the 80-20 rule. And as you can see, the long tail is uh, appearing when you start uh, looking at such distribution. So the interesting thing is that your caching, well, when you configure your cache, you should not try to think of caching all the values from the data set, but just a subset, but a very, very often accessed uh, subset. Um, before going further, uh, let's talk about a little bit of uh, caching uh, glossary, vocabulary. A hit, maybe you've already uh, uh, heard me uh, saying uh, this word. So a hit is when the cache is returning a value. And typically, a miss is when a cache does not have a value. The difference between cold and hot is that when your cache is empty, we can say that it is cold, and when it's full, uh, it's actually hot. It's a hot data set. Of course, in real life, what you want, your, well, you usually want your cache uh, to be full. Um, when you start uh, implementing caching in your application, when you start adding cache, caching to your application, you want to measure what is the impact of caching. This is one of the first things that you want to make sure of, is that is my cache being used or not. So of course, the cache usage is a very interesting metric uh, to look at. So is your cache empty? Is it full? So is it cold? Is it hot? This is a, an interesting question. So, you know, for example, if after an hour, your cache is still empty, well, maybe there's something wrong with it. Um, also, you will, you will want to have a look at the hit ratio. The hit ratio is a ratio between the number of hits, so when uh, the cache returns the values, over the misses plus hits, so it's the total access uh, of the cache. So of course, a good hit ratio is very important. Uh, and then finally, the hit rate. The hit rate is the number of hits uh, per second. And uh, this, this can account for the performance of your cache. So if your cache is delivering a good hit rate, then yes, you implemented uh, it correctly. When your cache is badly configured, you will have a slow hit rate. So uh, pay attention to, uh, to those metrics. OK. Um, Let's move on to the second, uh, second section of the presentation, that is caching on the JVM. First, I would like um, to tell you a little bit of, uh, of the history of caching on the JVM. I've got three timelines uh, in this slide, one for GSR 107, one for EHCache, and one for Terracotta. So GSR 107 is uh, the is also known as jcache or javax.cache. And this is uh, the specification for caching on the Java virtual machine. JSR 107, um, well, the history of JSR 107 begins in 2001 when there was a review uh, ballot. Then uh, ehcache and Terracotta came along in 2003, two years later. So it was the first release of uh, EHCache in 2003. And EHCache is, well, it actually means Easy Hibernate Cache. So as you can guess from, from its name, it's pretty, it was pretty uh, tightly coupled. Well, not coupled, but uh, well, almost. It was very popular to use uh, along with Hibernate, uh, the famous ORM on the JVM. So it's a caching library, actually. So you don't need to use it. Even at this time, you didn't need to use it with a Hibernate. You know, it's just a caching library. You drop it in your class path, and then you can start caching elements, caching requests and uh, objects and uh, requests to your uh, or a system of record, such as a database. Also, what about Terracotta? Uh, it was also released in 2003. Uh, so by Terracotta, we usually mean the Terracotta server. And Terracotta in 2003 was all about clustering your JVM. And in particular, it actually meant uh, clustering the Java memory model. So think, for example, of creating your objects and putting and running, using them uh, in the Terracotta server. 
those objects could be split across uh, several JVMs. So this is what uh, Coda Server was doing uh, at this time. Then, uh, six years later, uh, Terracotta Inc., uh, the company, they acquired Yeshcash. So, of course, uh, soon after, uh, there was the first release of Yeshcash that was able to interact with the Terracotta server. So, the cool thing is that um, making, well, um, making Terracotta compatible with Yeshcash, I mean, letting users, uh, letting Yeshcash users um, connect to the Terracotta cluster using the eHCache API. It was kind of leveraging the user base of eHCache. So that was a strong win for uh, Terracotta at this time to gain uh, uh, more users uh, via the use of eHCache to access the Terracotta cluster. And of course, it also began the, the era of the clustered store uh, on eHCache. And then, uh, quickly after came along of heap and of course it's going to uh, it was going to give birth to uh, the of heap store in eHCash. So for those of you who are not familiar with what we call of heap in the JVM world, well, you're probably familiar with on heap. So the heap is where all your um, instantiated objects are lying in your JVM. The thing with on heap is that it's subject to garbage collection. So whenever you start having heap sizes of more than um, more than several gigabytes, usually the garbage collection time um, can be uh, can be actually pretty long. I mean, long like several seconds or even more. So on heap access is not really predictable because you never know whenever a GC is going to come in and maybe the request is going to be stopped, you know, the stop the world during six seconds, and then sometimes it's not really acceptable if you have SLA to respect. So the cool thing with off heap is that off heap is actually uh, directly storing your objects uh, on the RAM of your machine. So there is no garbage collection uh, off heap, but there is a huge drawback also, is that you need to serialize your object before storing them as bytes directly off heap. So serializing actually means latency, it means processing. So even if off heap is more predictable, thanks to the absence of garbage collection, it's also a little bit slower. Uh, well, it's slower than on heap. But still, thanks to off heap, people could start using each cache to cache a lot of data just using one JVM. So this is uh, what we called uh, scale up. Well, back to JSI 107, 12 years later. Um, so in those 12 years, uh, Terracotta has been uh, pushing for uh, trying, to get, uh, G, uh, trying to get a first release of uh, JSI 107. And finally, it was, uh, it was coming to an end almost with a public review in 2013. And just one year later, the public release of GSR 107. It was actually from this moment that Java has um, an official specification for caching. The cool thing with a specification for caching on the JVM is that when, for example, you, uh, you are a Spring developer or a Hibernate developer or jhipster or any other kind of framework on the JVM, when you are working on, on those frameworks, you just need to support the integration with GSR 107. And immediately after, all the implementers, uh, of, all the implementers of GSR 107 are compatible with your framework. So you just need to write one integration, and then all the implementers of GSR 107 are going to work out of the box. And uh, today, already, uh, spring from version 4.1, and also Hibernate from version 5.1 or 5.2, they support GSR 107. So for the eHCache developer, or, uh, so well, for those developers working at Spring and Hibernate, they, don't, they just needed to write the support for GSR 107. And since eHCache 3 has out of the box GSR 107 support, you can immediately use uh, eHCache 3 with Hibernate uh, 5.2 or use eHCache 3 inside a Spring application. So yeah, eHCache 3 and Terracotta 5 released this year, um, six months ago, for eHCache 3. 
And what's the difference between each cache two and three? Why did we increment this number? Well, it's because we started uh, almost from scratch uh, with uh, a new design, a lot of cleanup of uh, you know legacy code that was uh, accumulated during the year, and also new features and very good performance as well. For Terracotta, uh, Terracotta Server, Terracotta 5 is the companion uh, for uh, the cluster store for EH Cache. A little bit more detail about uh, EH Cache. EH Cache 3, the EH Cache reboot. 3.0, it was the first official release in May 2016, May of this year. Of course, the main features were compatible with JSA 107, Javax.cache. Uh, also, the possibility to use a user managed cache for those times where you just want to use a cache um, not for the whole life of the application, but just for a smaller, just for a, a, a small lapse of time during the life of your application. So you don't need to, um, to initialize a cache manager. Copiers and serializers. Um, and EH Cache 3 is, is bringing you uh, some default ones, but you can also implement uh, your serializers. And serializers, if you remember what I just said a um, few slides ago, are very important whenever you start storing your, your data on, on stores that are not um, on stores that are not on heap. So for example, for off heap, disk, and the cluster store, you need to serialize your data, right? Because you're not on heap. So serializers, they play an important part of uh, the performance of your application when you're using uh, EH cache. Of also, uh, EH cache free brought some uh, strong typing. So maybe if you were uh, attending the presentation from Louis Jacome two days ago, a, uh, his presentation was a tool in action named EH cache out of his element is because in EH cache 2.x you needed to wrap uh, your key value mappings into elements. Now uh, we've got rid of this and getting rid of this allows us to provide a strong typing for key and values. Then uh, in the release, in the 3.1 release, so that happened in June 2016, the clustered uh, store was added, so it's our fourth um, store, right? On heap, of heap, disk, clustered. And also it was the first release uh, for the Terracotta server, Terracotta server 5. So what's the use of a clustered tier when you already got uh, on heap, of heap, and disk? Well, the clustered tier can be actually uh, used by several uh, clients. So imagine that you've got your web application, you're using caching, you just local caching, and then you start scaling up your application. Then in this, well, in this case, well, scaling out, sorry. So if you start adding some several instances of the same application, you want them to share the same cache. And the cluster tier can be shared, right? Because each application is going to open a connection to the Terracotta server, and is going to access, and is going to share its key value mappings with other instances. And I uh, will uh, go back on this uh, later. Then 3.2 was out two days ago. And it's bringing uh, high availability with the Terracotta server. So high availability is the support of passive servers. So and uh, also what we call replication. So meaning that your Terracotta server won't act as a single point of failure because it will have um, a backup plan, so um, a passive, uh, one or several passive, so that when the server crashes, then the passive uh, will be up, and then the clients are going to connect to the passive. So no downtime, um, no downtime possible with uh, high availability. Um, caching pattern. So there are several uh, caching patterns that you can use in your application when you start uh, relying on a cache. So the first one is no caching at all. All right, it sounds dumb, but it's really, really important to remember that your application should work without a cache. So if you start developing your application with caching in mind, well, this is, this is a pretty good idea. 
but you need to make sure at all time that when you unplug the cache, your application is still working. Of course, maybe the performance in production is going to be different, right? But during your testing, um, you should make sure that you're not making assertion on values, uh, on values being present in the cache or not. Why? Because remember uh, what EHCache developers uh, think of a cache. A cache should actually evict at any moment and should be able to expire any values, also any key value mappings at any moment. So don't tr trust values being in a cache. So if you want to test, use this uh, caching pattern, no caching at all. Unplug it and see if, if it continues to work. Then, um, another caching pattern, one of the most popular one, is cache aside. So let's take the example of an application. So here I divided this application um, in three circles. The first one, the business logic. So this is your, this is your business code. And this business logic is interacting with a cache and a system of record. So when you're using um, cache aside, you will, uh, you will code uh, your business logic to actually get uh, key mappings from the cache. So get k, k is your key. If the value is not there, then the cache is going to return null. So that actually means that your business logic needs to go and ask, go and ask the system of record. So the system of record can be a database or a remote web service, any kind of uh, element that is providing you with uh, data. Because we can see here that the system of record uh, contains the mapping key v, uh, key v. So the business logic, since it couldn't get the value from the cache, it's going to ask the system of record. So it's going to load uh, the value maybe just doing a select in a database. So load k and see if it gets uh, a value. So yeah, apparently the value v uh, was matching uh, the key k. Once your business logic uh, retrieves this value, then of course it needs to insert it into the cache so that next time the subsequent calls will go only through the cache, right? So next time uh, that the business logic is asking for the for the key key, uh, key K, when it will get it directly from the cache. This is the most popular one. Um, now another one is cash through. So uh, the same uh, actors here. We've got the business logic, the cache, the system of record that contains the key mapping KV. Business logic is only in cash through only interacting with a cache. It's not interacting with the system of record at all. So your business logic is doing a get on the cache. The cache doesn't have this key value mapping yet, so it's going to load k from the system of record. Since the system of record get uh, as a result, it's got v. When the cache receives uh, this value, it's going to put it internally. And then it's going to return the value to the business logic. Unfortunately, this operation, cache through, is not magic. It actually means that you need to implement a class, that is a, that is a loader writer class, that where, you will, uh, where you will explain to your cache how it should interact with your system of record. So why is it the case? Because you know, uh, no system records are, are the same, so it belongs to you, the developer, to know how to interact with your system of record. Um, let's have an example of those two uh, caching patterns uh, right now. So, um, uh, let's talk about the example application, and this is the EH cache uh, demo. If you're interested in it, you can actually get it from, uh, from GitHub. It's open source, and you can uh, have a look at the source code. So, in this demo, um, what we wanted to demonstrate is, of course, the use of, of EHCache. Um, in this demo, we have a list of actors, and actually it's a database, and this database is uh, loading uh, a dump file from uh, IMDB, from the Internet Movie Database. So we have a list of actors, and for each actor, you can click on the button on the right, and the button on the right is going to give you, um, is going to give you a weather report for several cities on the date of birth of, of this actor. 
Okay. So if I, I choose, for example, uh, this actor, then the application is going to retrieve uh, information um, about, uh, well, it's going to retrieve weather reports uh, for this actor. So he was born on September the 12th in Copenhagen, Denmark. So as you can see, we retrieved uh, several weather reports uh, for, the, for the date of birth of this actor. And also, we have provided you with a little um, performance analysis of the resources that were involved in this, uh, in the creation of this page. And as you can see, uh, the application needed to do several uh, web services calls, right? So some calls to the Google GeoCodeRest API, some calls to the Dark Sky uh, Weather REST API, and so on. As you can see, there are something like tens of them. And if you add them up, it took two seconds just getting the necessary data to generate this page. Uh, when, it's not, uh, when you are not using caching, whenever you're going to reload this page, well, you're going to pay the price. 1.5 seconds uh, this time, and there was no cache involved, and as you can see, well, it's pretty long. So, uh, let's fix this. Uh, let's make this uh, application a little bit more performant. So, this application, uh, so this application is based on Spring Boot, and actually, uh, more precisely, it's uh, relying on uh, JHipster for the application uh, generator. So here, in this piece of code, I am adding an annotation at cache result, and I'm providing it with a cache name, weather reports. And the, meta, the method that is being annotated with at cache result is the retrieve weather report. So thanks to this uh, annotation, I'm going to cache the results of, uh, of all the invocations of this, um, of this method, provided that uh, well, and of course it's going to make performance better, provided that the user is loading, um, is loading, is calling this method uh, with the same keys, with the same arguments. And here the key is a combination of location and local date date. And what does, uh, does this annotation uh, do in detail? Well, as you can see, uh, according to the Java doc, this annotation is the perfect definition of cache aside. The Java doc says that if a value is found in the cache, um, uh, the value is going to be returned immediately, and the annotated method is, not, is never actually executed. If no value is found, the annotated method is invoked, and the return value is stored in the cache with the generated key. This is the definition of cache aside. This annotation is not uh, EHCache or Spring specific, it's uh, JSR 107. So, Basically, whenever you, uh, you're using a framework with JSR 107 support, you just need to add this annotation where you need it, and you're done. Uh, OK, so I forgot to restart the application, uh, just to show you the impact. Waiting for the application to restart. Maybe you're wondering how my cache and my cache manager uh, have been configured. So let's have a look. Um, First, in Spring, uh, you need to you need to tell Spring uh, what um, how it should get the configuration. So for that, we've got this file here. So here we are specifying that cache.jcache.config equals ehcache.xml. So let's have a look at ehcache.xml. And ehcache.xml is defining a cache template. So this cache template has a name, simple, and a few configuration elements, such as the TTL. The TTL is the time to leave. So it means that uh, each element inserted in the cache will not stay longer than 60 seconds. There's also uh, a, another interesting uh, configuration element is the TT, uh, TTI, is the time to interval. And that will be each element that is not being accessed uh, during a period of 60, of 60 seconds will be also removed from the cache. Here, I'm just using heap, uh, the heap tier, with 1,000 elements. Um, I got a bunch of uh, J, -hipster, um, J hipster entities that are being cached, and also I've got my weather reports. Um, 
uh, cache. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at uh, the impact. Now I'm going to reload the same page. So once again, it's going to take a while to generate because it needed to go and get all the values, uh, all, the, all the results. Now, if I reload it, since it's cached, bam, super fast. What happened? Just two milliseconds. Two milliseconds was, you know, just the time to, to get all this data and display it. So as you can see, pretty efficient, right? Just one annotation, you're done, pretty easy. Um, thanks, uh, thanks also to uh, the integration of uh, uh, GSI 107 metrics in JHipster. Uh, yeah, because I forgot to say that in JSI 107 you get an API, but there's also uh, an MBIN, a statistics uh, MBIN, and you can actually um, uh, request uh, some statistics from this MBIN. It has been integrated here in this application, so let's go to the metrics page. In the metrics page, you can see the efficiency of uh, your cache with few information, such as the number, uh, so the cache hits. So how many times um, the cache could return a value that was being asked to it. So we had five hits, five misses. So the five misses were the first time I loaded the page. You know, it just, uh, the, um, this data wasn't cached yet, so you needed to insert it in the cache. And um, of course, once the value, all the, all the calls were made, we inserted those values into the cache. And this is why also we got some hits. The cash hit is 50%. Um, the cash hit ratio is uh, 50%. Uh, why? It's because we have done 10 calls, 10 gets, and only five times we could, uh, the cash could re return uh, the result. And we've got some other stats. I'm talking about stats because it's really important to control, to measure uh, the impact of your cash. Otherwise, uh, you could um, you could lose sight of your performance. You know what? Um, let's, uh, let's try another example. Let's define a heap size of one element. So what does that mean? It means that whenever we hit this capacity of one element, um, then for the next call, the cache won't have the capacity to insert some other elements. So if you're trying to insert five elements, just like we did, it's not going to work anymore. Right, because there's just only um, one spot available in the heap. So the cache will spend its time inserting values, key values in the cache, and also evicting this value for the next value. Right. So let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look uh, of what could be the in impact. Uh, let's go to. Uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, whatever. Let's try with this example. So here, uh, first call, of course, is not being cached, so everything is pretty normal. I'm going to reload the page. And same thing, the cache uh, wasn't used for the, for, the second lo um, for the second loading of this page. So what happened? Well, just as I told you, the, uh, the way the cache is configured is totally uh, unusable for this use case, right? Because for each page load, we need at least five spots available. But there's only one, right? So the cache keeps on, as you can see, it's still putting data. It's putting data, it's trying to put data, but every time it's putting data, then the next time it's going to try to put some other thing, it's going to be evicted. So the efficiency of your, of, uh, your cache is zero, right? It's the ratio between the hit and the hits plus misses. So, once again, try to focus on measuring the impact of your cache. Try to dimension your cache, um, knowing well, knowing your use cases. But it's pretty important. Uh, back to the demo very quickly. Uh, I told you about cache through, um, and I've got an example from another demo. Uh, and actually, this is the demo that we are running in the booth right now. Maybe you've seen it. You know, with huge figures and TPS and latency. So this piece of code is configuring the cache programmatically. And the difference here is that we are not using cache aside programmatically. We are using um, a cache loader writer. And meaning that in this application, uh, they're only interacting with the cache, right? Because the SOR, 
the system of record loader writer is the one that is going to uh, retrieve the values from the system of record. You remember, everything, um, when you're using cache through, the cache is your gateway uh, to the system of record. So let's have a look at how we configured this loader writer. As you can see, they implemented cache loader writer and implementing this uh, interface, they needed to provide an, uh, an implementation for load. And during the load, they are just doing the system of record dot load data key. So they're just getting the data from the database or from uh, any system of record. They also implemented load all. What they didn't implement though is write and write all, but um, because they were not inserting new values in the system of record, but if you needed to insert values in the system of record, you could actually implement write and write all. So whenever you're going to do a put in the cache, the loader writer will actually insert this value in the system of record. Um, okay. Third section of this presentation, clustered caching with the Terracotta server. Um, I already explained it uh, a little bit earlier on. So what is a Terracotta server tier? So let's have a look uh, in more detail right now. So this is the typical application of, of, a, of a clustered cache use case. You've got uh, two instances of an application and this application has already configured a cache with several tiers. Heap tier, you remember, very efficient, but you shouldn't put too many elements in it because of garbage collection. Then also the off heap tier, very large, very uh, predictable, but slower than the heap tier. And finally, the cluster tier with, as you can see with the arrow, the cluster tier that is connecting to the Terracotta server and providing you uh, this remote storage provided by the Terracotta server, JVM. So the hot data is cached locally, hotter data in faster tiers, so faster tiers uh, is the heap tier in this case. The very cool thing, uh, very cool feature of Terracotta server clustering is that the data cached by one application instance is available to all cluster members. Okay? So if you, if you did if you inserted some values in application one, then application two, if it's using the same clustered cache, is going to also have it, also be able to access it. So as you can see, thanks to this architecture, you are lowering the burden on your system of record. So for example, if your system of record is a database, it means that your database will receive less requests. The full data set is available um, to the cluster. So this is a very important um, architecture uh, design decision from the Cache team to say that um, the, larger, um, the larger tier, so this is the cache authority, should contain every element, every um, key value mappings of the cache. And then the uh, smaller tiers, just a subset, just a very hot subset. So one or more mirror servers may be deployed to provide high availability. This feature uh, was released two days ago for EH Cache 3. Uh, of course, I didn't mention it, but in EH Cache 2 and Terracotta 4.x, that is the previous release, uh, it's, uh, it's already available. It has been available for a long time already. And also, soon to come, is the ability to span data across multiple active servers. And this is a feature that we call striping and um, it's coming pretty soon. Um, you can get this schema from the ehcache.org documentation, which is pretty up to date. Another view of this um, deployment. So right now in the next demo, I'm going to reuse the same web, web application. You remember the application with the actors and the weather reports for their uh, birthday. But this time I'm going to scale this application. Um, I'm going to scale it to three instances. All those three instances will be running inside their own container uh, using Docker containers. 
Um, there is one database also being deployed, one PostgreSQL uh, database running in its own container, and also one Terracotta server running uh, in its own container. Uh, by the way, uh, you can actually find on Docker Hub some uh, Docker images for the Terracotta server, uh, for the Terracotta server open source. Um, okay, so let's go to the demo. Um, so, here I'm going to, um, it seems to be a little bit small, can you, can you still read? Yeah, it's really, really small. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, sorry about this. Um, anyway. Okay, I'm going to try to read because it's really, really small. Um, so the first line is, so here this line represents the container uh, for our system of records. So it's a PostgreSQL database. Then the second line here uh, is showing the container uh, for the Terracotta server. As you can see, the state is up, meaning it's running. And then we have three lines for our three instances of the web application connected to the Terracotta cluster and connecting to the database. Oh, let's have a look. Uh, those three uh, instances, uh, they are running in containers and the ports are bound to my local host, so I can uh, access them with localhost and I just need to shift a little bit the port number. As you can see here, the first instance is running in a container named 62 something, then the other one in a container named OE something, and the third one is running in a container named AC something. So let's try with this one. And uh, of course, let's sign in first. So some application, let's, uh, let's find uh, Let's find an actor and then uh, let's try to get the weather reports for the for a birth date of this actor. Here, as you can see, it took uh, three seconds. And then if I refresh very fast, because uh, all those containers are using uh, caching, of course. But since it's also clustered caching, it means that if I copy just this value, you know, the tail of this URL, star 1016, to any other containers, then it was super fast as well because it used because since they couldn't get it locally in the on heap or off heap tiers, it, they just used the cluster tier, so they just connected to the Terracotta server and got uh, the mapping back. Same thing if I go to this other instance, super fast because it was in cache. So this is a very, really cool like, aspect of a Terracotta server. When you start scaling out your application, you can actually leverage the Terracotta cluster um, to ease the pain on external resources. And also, um, those resources could be expensive, right? Because actually I'm paying when I'm doing a request to the Dark Sky uh, REST API. So it can also make you save money. Um, also, I would like to show you a little bit how it was configured, how the cache was configured, uh, very quickly. As you can see, scaling out is just as simple as adding a bit of configuration in your ehcache.xml. So here, I'm defining a service in my ehcache.xml. Uh, one uh, important addition to ehcache-free, I forgot to say, is that it supports services, so ehcache-free is extensible. So here, uh, we are defining a connection to a Terracotta cluster. We provide the URL to this uh, Terracotta cluster and also a default resource because the Terracotta server is, um, in your Terracotta server, you can define several resources such as OFIP resources and soon to come um, FRS resources. But anyway, you can define OFIP resources and those OFIP resources can be used by the cluster tier. So if I go to the cache template named clustered, expiry is defined. And in the resources, I've got the heap tier and also a cluster dedicated tier with size 10 megabytes. 
Um, there's also some other concepts such as uh, clustered shared, where several caches can share the same, um, the same, uh, and share the same uh, storage. Um, okay. Back to the presentation. Um, we're already at the end of the presentation. I would like to talk to you about deployment examples. Of course, ESH Cache Free, Terracotta Server 5, they are all new. They just got out six months ago, so I, don't, I, I cannot tell you that we have customers uh, running, uh, running in production with ESH Cache Free and Terracotta Server 5. But what I can tell you, though, is what our customers are doing with Terracotta Server 4 and ESH Cache 2. Here in this example, um, you can see that uh, there is a presentation zone um, that is made to retrieve information about the user and also an application zone interacting with a system of record to make uh, their application uh, consume less resources, so less calls to the system of record. They used Terracotta, and with Terracotta, they actually deployed tens of Terracotta servers in the cluster, so tens meaning that if you have, for example, uh, 10 stripes and each stripe has one active, one passive, it's already 20 Terracotta servers running. Hundreds of clients, meaning that uh, their, uh, their, uh, their web application deployed in any web server container, having uh, ESH cache could actually, uh, well, each of them was connecting, is connecting to the Terracotta cluster. So you see those figures, you know, um, it's not just the simple example that I just showed you earlier on. You can actually scale with uh, Terracotta Server and ESH Cache clients. Um, and also, uh, this customer was using the Terracotta Management Console to have a look at the performance of his application and uh, also using the um, integration into New Relic. Um, this is the end. Uh, here I'm sharing with you a uh, few links and references uh, about the world of caching, caching on the JVM, and also clustered cache. ESH cache-free documentation is pretty good for that. And also there is a very nice presentation that was given at Devox, uh, Devox UK, Caching 101, uh, by Louis Jacome and Aurélien Brosniewski, uh, two engineers of the ESH cache team. Once again, please feel free to visit our booth uh, downstairs, booth number one, and thank you very much for listening.